Okay, my name is Don Sear. I'm from Brock University in uh, the Niagara region of Canada. Um, my two colleagues are in the uh, Department of Economics there, Lester Kwan and uh, Ling Sun. Um, we're looking at uh, something we were playing with uh, this year that um, uh, is looking at the on premier uh, wine tasting and rating process, and in particular, uh, Robert Parker and his successor, Neil Martin. Um, it's based a little bit on some work that we did uh, last year. We were looking at Parker's ratings uh, in relationship to prices, or prices in relationship to his ratings. And we were using um, uh, some copula function technology to take a look at that. And then uh, this year, as we, uh, you know, as uh, things developed in, uh, in 2016, particularly last year, as I'll, as I'll note, Neil Martin has taken over for uh, the Board of Wine Tasting uh, overall. Uh, we came across uh, some data that we thought we'd take a look at with the same technology and see if we can see uh, some relationship. And um, so that's where, uh, that's where we're at with this. Um, uh, just a little bit, of course, the on premier process, something that takes place every year. Uh, futures market in the sense that uh, the wine is sold before it is bottled, uh, up to one or two years before. Um, the benefit to producers, uh, the provide the opportunity for the producer to lock down a price, at least uh, for some of the wine. Uh, the, for the purchaser, of course, is the benefit. The benefit to the producer is the cash flow before uh, bottling. There's some uncertainty. Uh, the Chateau has to decide how much wine to allocate to in this futures market as opposed to the retail market uh, when, the bottle, when the wine is finally bottled and released. Um, and of course the higher the price uh, dependent upon let's say a wine critic score, uh, the more that that risk is, uh, is mitigated. Parker, of course, uh, has been recognized as having a significant impact upon the Bordeaux en premier market. Uh, his ratings uh, have been related uh, in a number of studies uh, to uh, en premier uh, wine prices. Um, of course, there's a lot of studies uh, that have been looking at ratings and uh, wine prices. Uh, the 2015 paper, which was a meta-analysis of that, over 60 studies, 180 hedonic wine price models over a 20-year period, and, and a moderate partial correlation of 0.3 is what they came up with in terms of prices and that. So in February 2015, this is after 38 years, Parker announced he would no longer review Bordeaux wine futures and the responsibility would fall to his successor, Neil Martin, a, uh, a British wine critic who started the Wine Journal in 2003, gained a substantial following and joined uh, the Wine Advocate as a critic in 2006. And then in April 2016, uh, Martin received, uh, took responsibility over uh, the tasting of all Bordeaux wines for the wine advocate. So a significant shift. The issue is that Parker um, has, had, has been credited with a significant impact on Bordeaux wines. Uh, it's been said that he pushed the industry into new technology and equipment, uh, greater consistency over the years. Uh, it's had some controversy. He's been criticized for advoc advocating a style over substance. Uh, a homogenous world of highly oaked and over extracted wines has uh, been the criticism of his influence. So now, of course, if you've gone down that road and you've tooled up to aim for a high Parker rating, you now face, you know, some uncertainty because it's a new person on the block and uh, what exactly uh, is going to be the impact of that. And that's what we were trying to take a look at to see if we could see something, and we, there's a database that uh, we've worked with before um, that uh, 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 Dutch uh, wine brokers maintain, borderview.com, and for over 2010 through 2012, both Parker and Neil Martin uh, rated independently 
quite a number of wines in the on-premier market. So that was an interesting data set we thought to take a look at and see what is the connection between these two, if there is one, and, and can we delineate it in some way. So the data provided for about 325 left bank uh, wine ratings and uh, 332 in the case of the right bank over that three year period, about 100 in each, each year, you'll see the numbers on that. And of course, we wanted to take a look at the two uh, banks because um, both critics have expressed uh, some, you know, preference for uh, the Merlot, <coughs> the right bank wines. And um, both critics use the same Parker rating system of 50 to 100. Um, those of you that have done ratings and, and combinations of ratings, the technology that we're using in copula functions, this is not an issue uh, in the sense that you don't have to take, do some adjustment for ratings in the, in the approach that we use, but in this case it just so happens that both, uh, both of them use the same, uh, 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 same rating uh, process. Um, so what were we doing? We're using a copula function approach. Um, there's always this issue of model risk when you're looking at something, uh, your assumptions about the, uh, the uh, particularly about the correlation, uh, the stationarity of it, and the fundamental structure. So one of, of, let's say, two or more variables and their relationship. Um, copula functions are in a, an approach uh, that differs from uh, what we typically see in terms of regression, where what we're trying to do is model a, in this case, a bivariate distribution and see what it's shaped like, what is its correlation. Uh, is the correlation stationary over, the over time or over the range of values uh, or uh, is there something changing? And that's the benefit of copula functions is an attempt to capture what's called tail dependence where two variables may be more highly correlated in their extreme values, either their extreme high values or extreme low values, or even we can mix that up and have high and low as well. I always like to point out uh, 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 that uh, this technology, which crept into the finance area back about 10 years ago, has been attributed to as, as being one of, the, one, of the, one of the drivers for the 2008 financial crisis uh, because copula functions were used to model uh, collateralized debt obligations and the probability of uh, default uh, among uh, mortgage holders. Now I'll show you where they used the wrong copula function and that was uh, the issue but in any event what it did was it made these CDOs look uh, a lot less risky than they absolutely were but this is where the technology first sort of uh, began to pop up. It's based upon some work done in 1959, Sklar's theorem. And uh, I've just got a bunch of, you know, mathematics up here that is really just meant to, you know, completely throw you in and so that you will not ask me anything further about it. Okay, but the basic idea behind his theorem is that uh, we can define some multivariate distribution as being a some functional form called the copula which uh, brings together marginal distributions and then there's a dependence parameter that's in there so this this functional form uh, he pro proved you can find this independent of the marginal distributions and the whole thing gives you the multivariate distribution. So that's the basic uh, idea behind it. And what that means is that you can separate out the process of finding the copula function uh, from the identification of the marginal distributions. And that, uh, that's the, uh, the whole sort of theme there. Um, you, what happens in this process is there's some standard forms for the copula function that you can test for, see which one fits better. Um, the, the traditional ones are the Gaussian and standard, or student T copula. 
because we know they're multivariate distributional forms, so we're easy to work with that. In the case of the CDOs in 2008, they were using a Gaussian copula, and it turned out that was the wrong thing uh, to use. And um, then there's some Archimedean copulas, which have some closed forms that we can grasp as well. And uh, they're particularly the Clayton, Frank, and Gumbel, and uh, we go um, uh, through and look for which of these fits. What do they look like? Well, what we do is we take the variables that we're looking at and we transform these into a uniform 0, 1 variable. So you've got, you can't see it too well here, but 0 to 1 of two variables. And these are just examples of what the copula function would look like uh, and how the data would appear. And so we're doing the reverse, of course, looking at the data, looking for the copula. This is the normal distribution. Uh, the T and uh, the ones that are often time of interest are ones that pick up tail dependence, that perhaps the correlation is greater in the lower values of the two variables. Uh, the gumbo picks up, um, you know, tail dependence at the upper end. It does also pick up a little bit of lower tail uh, dependence as well in its form. And the Frank copy, although it doesn't show very well here, picks up higher correlation in the middle of the range of the variables. And so what you're doing is you're taking your data, transforming it to zero, one variables, and then testing for these copulas, which is why when if you approach this from using other raters, uh, you don't have to be worrying about uh, change, you know, adjusting those rating variables because you're going to be going to a zero, one uh, variable anyways. We can also take a look and use um, the copulas in a way that um, we can examine, for example, taking the Clayton copula, which usually picks up this, is meant to pick up this lower tail dependence. We can transform the variables and look for other uh, relationships as well. And what's going to be important for us in the results is you're going to see that we, we find that a Clayton copula in the, number, in the figure number four uh, is um, uh, the data has been inverted and that was a, a best fitting copula in many instances for us. Although in the transformed data, what it's picking up is uh, tail dependence and in, in the upper values. Uh, there's also in this, in this methodology, some tail dependence parameters that you can look at. They're sort of like correlation coefficients. They go from values of zero to one and um, they, uh, uh, they can be uh, obtained in, in some instances. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at those as well. So the data, again, comes out of this uh, uh, database on raters and wines that uh, is uh, maintained. And you have Robert Parker's ratings and Neil Martin's there. And this is over 2010 to 2012. So uh, now when you're testing these copula functions, generally it's uh, maximum likelihood is the standard approach. There's still some debate on, in this about what's the best thing, but that has boiled down to be the general approach. Uh, you can use the AIC, the BIC, or the HQIC. We used all three to test for what's the best fitting. There was no inconsistency in the results uh, when we did that. Um, I won't talk about the goodness of fit uh, tests if you want uh, some sense of power. Um, but um, uh, so anyways, what we did is in for each of the years in free both the left and right bank, we looked at what was a best fitting copula uh, for the data. And uh, what we found <coughs> was kind of interesting. Uh, we found that for the left bank, uh, 2010, here's for each year, 2010, 11, 12, what was the best fitting copula? And uh, 2010 for the left bank, uh, this is between the ratings of Parker and Neil Martin. How closely are they connected? What is the nature of that connection? The normal or Gaussian copula in 2010. And then 2011-12 for the left bank, you notice that what we're picking up 
with this Clayton, which has been inverted, Clayton copula, which is inverted, is significant tail dependence at the upper level. And here you see the uh, upper tail uh, dependence values. I'm losing a little bit of power here with this thing. Um, this is the parameter of tail dependence. And you can see that 2011-12, uh, this begins to have some impact. So the two of them are on the highly ranked wines starting to have some consistency. If you go to the right bank though, what's kind of interesting is it starts falling apart in the sense that in 2010, uh, there was significant tail dependence in the data and that the two were doing, you know, pretty closely ranking high, uh, high ranked wines together. And then at 2011-12, it starts falling apart. And obviously, there is some, there's a correlation, of course, between the two, but it is not as consistent in the upper ranked wines as it was. So what that leads us, you know, uh, to think about is what is the, you know, did Martin start to develop his own idiosyncratic preferences, particularly when it comes to the left bank wines and where they both had some preference and what's that going to do uh, going forward. Now we do have three years of, of Martin's uh, rankings of, of the on premier wines. They just finished up uh, very recently this year for you know last year's uh, production. And uh, so now the next thing is let's take a look at how prices are relating to that. But definitely if you were a left bank producer, Neil Martin is not necessarily ranking in the same way as, uh, as Parker was and what appears to be, at least that's what we're seeing uh, in this technology. You know, there's different ways you can go at this quantile regression is another more discrete breakdown, uh, but the copula functions, if you're trying to fit the, the multivariate distribution, uh, goes from there. We then looked at the marginal distribution, so you, the second step of, of that uh, copula function modeling is to identify the marginal distributions. Uh, you know, can we use the same marginal distributions for the two of them? No, it doesn't look like it's the same. Their, their ratings over those three year periods give us different marginal distributions. Um, Martin's right bank ratings, uh, that marginal distribution appears to exhibit fatter tails than what Parker was getting. Um, they both have some skewness in the data, which is something that we might uh, expect, but there is a difference. So going forward, we have to model that. And that's our next steps in this, which we haven't done as of yet, is the identification, those choice of a couple of different choices of marginal distributions in combination with the copula. And then what you're testing for is the combination of those two choices, the two-step choice of the copula and the marginal distributions, what gives you the best representation of a bivariate distribution. And then you can go from there and do a lot of things in terms of risk analysis as to uh, the correlation between, if I get a Neil Martin rating, how, you know, what, what's the probability that that related to a, to a high Parker rating? Uh, the database contains a number of other uh, wine ratings, of course, and we're still sort of playing around with some of that um, uh, in terms of future research. A lot of this work with copial functions and something else that we're exploring in the agricultural economics area has to do with the impact of weather. So, you know, weather upon uh, grape growing, it's the extreme weather events that uh, have a more significant impact. And you see a lot of studies in agricultural economics that have been turning to copula functions for drawing that connection between yield, uh, between quality, and different weather variables. And so this is a fruitful area to take a look at. We did do, I did do some work in this area a few, a few years ago with some colleagues in, uh, up in Sonoma uh, around uh, BRICS levels on the grapes and uh, weather data. But interestingly enough, in 
California, uh, they're allowed to add water uh, when they go in there for measurement. So you could see that things were capped off at BRICS levels, even though you had very high extreme heat, uh, you know, the measurements were not picking up. So we weren't getting the, the uh, tail dependence. And that's uh, the end for me. So any questions uh, that I can take? <laughs>